Managing NIPPV at Home and Indications to Return to the Hospital by Dr. Dennis Rosen. Hi, I'm Dennis Rosen. I'm an attending physician in the Division of Respiratory Diseases in the Department of Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital and Assistant Professor of Pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Welcome to Open Pediatrics. Today I'm going to discuss the management of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation in the home setting. For the purposes of today's talk, I'm mainly going to be focusing on the management and use of CPAP and BiPAP in the home setting. CPAP being continuous positive airway pressure, BiPAP being bi-level positive airway pressure. Generally speaking, both of these forms of positive airway pressure are generated by a machine which then pumps air through a hose into a mask which is worn over the nose, over the mouth, over the entire face, um, and maintains positive pressure within the upper airways. Oftentimes, this is used to treat conditions such as obstructive sleep apnea, but it can also be used as a form of non-invasive ventilation, uh, for example, in conditions of central sleep apnea, of hypoventilation, and of ongoing hypoxia. Positive airway pressure adherence. When we prescribe positive airway pressure, it's really important to remember that PAP is a treatment and not a cure, which means that if people don't use the PAP, it's not going to accomplish any of its goals. Therefore, it's critically important to focus on factors which can improve adherence with the PAP. Studies that have been done looking at factors which influence adherence have found that lower positive airway pressure adherence can be associated with lower socioeconomic status, with a poor mask fit, with an increased air leak from the mask, and with poor initial experience with CPAP or with BiPAP. And this makes a lot of sense. If the mask you're wearing on your face is not comfortable or is not serving the purpose that it is designed to do, um, you will tend not to want to wear it. Conversely, higher adherence with PAP has been noted with greater use in the first week with involvement of a respiratory therapist, particularly in those cases where children or adults do not like to wear it and are not using it for uh, periods greater than an hour a day. Perception of benefits, very important to impress upon the patient and the family the importance of using the positive airway pressure to explain what it is meant to achieve and to uh, explain what it is meant to prevent. Good communication with caregivers. This is always something which is important, certainly when thinking about the communication between healthcare givers and patients and families, but also within the family itself. It is very important that the uh, family dynamic be such that uh, fosters cooperation and collaboration between the parents and the children. This is something that as um, healthcare providers we have less control over, but it is something uh, which we need to think about, um, especially when we try and craft strategies to engage the parents in making sure the child receives uh, the treatment that we would like them to receive. Finally, it's also really important to remember the effect of the larger social framework, um, the larger family, the larger society, and how it responds to the child and the child's new need for wearing um, CPAP or BiPAP at night. The themes that emerge from this are that when a child successfully uses their PAP early on and doesn't have bad experiences with it, and their support from the medical system, but also within the family, the likelihood of achieving higher adherence is greater. And so we approach this here in a multi-phase approach, um, which starts even before we start the titration and continues well after we've started the child on PAP, as I will try and explain. Titration. So prior to titration, it's, it's really important to explain to the child and the family what it is we're trying to accomplish, explain what using PAP entails. Um, with younger children, that doesn't always work as well, just because their ability to comprehend what we are describing is, is, is usually, is oftentimes less um, abstract than the concepts that we are discussing. Um, but, but at the very least, it's important to try and find an interface which is both comfortable and uh, relatively um, stress-free for the child. So especially when we're dealing with younger children, it's very important for us to bring them into contact with the interface that they're going to be using and to have them familiarize themselves with it so as to eliminate the fear factor aspect. So what we will do is we will have our children meet with one of the um, 
respiratory therapists or with a polysomnography techs, find a mask that fits the child, find the appropriate size mask, usually through um, a game. We then oftentimes send the mask home with the parent, have the parent put the mask on the child, put the mask on themselves, put the mask on the teddy bear, in order to try and eliminate um, the, the phobias or, or stress that may accompany using, uh, using this, the PAP mask. And this is really important because the last thing we want to have happen is to bring a child into the sleep lab, put a CPAP mask on his or her face, and then have them refuse to wear it and essentially not sleep for the entire night. That's a, 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 a bad waste of time and resources. And so as you can see here in one of these pictures, there's actually, there are actually teddy bears which have been crafted by some of the companies which, uh, which, which come with CPAP masks. To explain to the child what CPAP is, what a mask is, and how it fits. Um, I did come across another example of anticipatory preparation. This was prepared by uh, the parent of a child who needed to undergo CPAP titration and essentially prepared this model with a Barbie doll um, presenting what sleeping with CPAP looks like. During the titration, it's uh, really important to try and do it in as comfortable um, and as non-confrontational a manner as possible. We typically um, will try and put the CPAP on before the child falls asleep. However, if there is resistance or the child struggles with this, we will do so after the child falls asleep. It is not uncommon for the child to take the mask off the child, his or her face and for the mask to need to be replaced several times. We also pay a lot of attention to positioning of the child. We know, for example, that sleeping supine with the head of the bed completely flat um, will actually make obstructive sleep apnea worse in many cases because of the gravitational forces pulling at the tongue and at the, uh, at the other structures of the, upper air, of the upper airway. And so we will often employ uh, positioning such as elevating the head of the bed to a 30 degree angle, having the child sleep on their side in order to um, facilitate their breathing and perhaps necessitate lower pressure settings than those that we may find ourselves needing to use if the child um, is sleeping flat on their back and supine. Um, sometimes we, we need to use higher pressures. Uh, for example, if a child is uh, quite obese um, and has obstructive sleep apnea, and we find ourselves going into uh, the teens uh, in terms of pressure settings, we often find ourselves switching over to BiPAP bi-level positive airway pressure instead of CPAP in order to afford extra expiratory relief so that the child does not have to exhale against such high pressure as they require during inspiration. Once we have um, found out what settings the child requires, we will prescribe it. Those members of the audience who work here in the United States know that uh, insurance issues are a big deal and so um, most of the time we need to uh, write prescriptions in a very specific manner and this is an example of a prescription that I might write for a child who needs CPAP here in Massachusetts calling for CPAP of six centimeter water with the sleep net mini me mask size small with headgear tubing heated humidifier chamber filters downloadable compliance data lifetime need diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea 11 refills and provide the mass health number and it, it, it's unfortunate that I have to even spend time on this but but this is one of the realities that we uh, we, we deal with in our current prescribing environment. After the child uh, has had the titration study, and we, we, I try to bring them back within two to three weeks after the titration. This takes into consideration the time it takes for the CPAP to be approved, for it to be delivered, for the child to start using it, um, and then to have a few days of use prior to coming to see me. I like to have the child come to see me with the mask the and the machine, and during that visit, I, tr I check on a number of things. The first thing I, I ask is to find out how the child is finding its use and what problems the child is having. I have the child place the mask on her face, and I run my fingers around the perimeter in order to make sure that there is no air leak. I check for water condensation in the hosing and check for water condensation in the mask. I look for and ask about irritation or even skin breakdown on the face. I check the pressure settings to make sure they're appropriate. I set, I check the ramp time to make sure it's appropriate. I check the uh, C-flex settings, which are, um, which is a setting which allows for slight expiratory relief. And talking about all these things at the first follow-up visit, I feel is very important. It talking about these things prior to having received the mask makes it very abstract and makes it difficult to remember. And even if I were to write all these things out, it would be very difficult for the family 
to remember all of them. However, once they have started to use the mask, once they've started to struggle with it, once they've been given the humidifier to specific settings but found that it's either too high or too low, um, once they find that the ramp pressure is not sufficient or is overly slow, we can talk about those things and we can make the adjustments. And this is really, really important. And if you'll remember back to one of the first slides, which I showed you, the degree of use in the first week and the initial experience right after prescription are, the, are perhaps the most important factors that, that dictate whether or not a child is going to be adherent with positive airway pressure. Um, we discuss other issues, puffy, dry eyes. There's certain, that certainly can happen. It's not very common, but you can sometimes see uh, air pushing up from the nose through the nasolacrimal ducts and into the eyes, and that can cause the, the, the eyes to be um, puffy in the morning. Children who complain of a dry mouth often do so because they are opening their mouth. So if they have a nasal mask and air is flowing in through the nose, but their mouth is open, the airflow will seek out the point of least resistance and flow out through the mouth. And that in turn can cause a reduction in pressure, an increase in airflow as the machine tries to compensate for the drop in pressure, and that can cause the mouth to dry out. If that's what's happening, if the child is, is breathing through an open mouth despite wearing a nasal mask, we need to think about other options. For example, the use of a chin strap, such as I'll show you in a few minutes, or perhaps using a full face mask. Nasal congestion is something which can be seen when the air that's being breathed in is too cold or too dry. As you know, one of the many purposes of the nose is to heat and humidify air. And if the air is cold and dry, the nasal mucosa will swell up in order to impart that humidity, but that will also cause the nasal passages to be narrowed down and for the, it to be more difficult to breathe in through the nose. Aerophasia is something which is uh, frequently encountered, um, certainly um, in children who have lower muscle tone. Um, and this is something which can be um, alleviated specifically in kids who have G-tubes by, by venting out the G-tube. And I'll show you some examples of that in a bit. Aspiration is certainly a concern um, of many people, particularly when using a full face mask. Um, that said, there are a lot of studies which have shown that use of CPAP to treat obstructive sleep apnea, for example, actually reduces the degree of GE reflux. And so, while certainly a theoretical issue, I personally have not um, encountered that. Certainly, if you are caring for a child with a G-tube or a child who is receiving nocturnal feeds, it would make a lot of sense to try and vent the G-tube, as I'll show you, and or to reduce the quantity of feeds or the flow rate of the feeds per hour in order to um, reduce the stomach volume and reduce the likelihood of an aspiration. Pneumothorax is certainly a hypothetical possibility, though I, I've never, never seen that. And finally, mid-face hypoplasia. There is concern about the possibility of mid-face hypoplasia, especially in younger children, because of the pressure of the mask on the nose, nasal bridge, and the maxilla. Okay, machine and mask care. This is um, something which certainly um, we need to think about. It's important to talk to the uh, family about washing out the mask and the tubing um, to dry them every day. You want to make sure the heated humidifier is washed out as well. The masks, although they do get replaced every few months, have an inner lining which typically is replaced once every month. Regardless, it can become dirty with secretions and so it is important with warm soapy water just to rinse and allow it to dry. Um, the filters need to be changed frequently. Um, it is important, very important to stress that when families take the, mat, the machine on the road, for example if they're traveling or even coming to visit you in your office, that they make sure to empty out the heated humidifier chamber because if water sloshes from that into the motor it will damage the machine and potentially render it unusable. Troubleshooting. Okay, so now I'd like to talk a little bit about troubleshooting some issues which may arise with um, the, the CPAP and the BiPAP. The first one, which is quite commonly heard, especially in younger children um, from parents, is that the child won't put or won't keep the mask on. And this is certainly um, something which, is, which is, is difficult, and really the solutions to this are age dependent. Um, I think it's really important to um, reinforce the importance of using the CPAP to the families, make sure they understand why it's important for them to try and do it, and also to discuss with them um, strategies for, for working with it. So certainly one can, one can strategize for habituation. In other words, do some of the exercises which I discussed earlier, such as putting the mask on the parent, putting the mask on the teddy bear, in order to reduce stress and anxiety. Another thing which parents um, certainly can do is to try and put the mask on the child after the child falls asleep. 
In some cases, one might consider using sleep aids, especially in the case of a developmentally delayed child who uh, is, is agile enough to pull the mask off their face, um, but really not able to understand why they need to keep it on. One can make use of, of welcome sleeves or, or arm restraints to prevent flexion of the elbows and to prevent the child from pulling at the mask. Um, and uh, the other thing to remember is, I think, it, is that it takes a lot of time to see success for some children. There are studies um, such as that done by Valerie Kirk in Calgary looking at how long it takes to habituate children to CPAP, finding that children habituated anywhere from the first night all the way to 330 days out. I really try and, 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 and consider various strategies such as being attentive to CPAP use for the first four hours of the night and no more. Um, in, or, in other words, sitting next to the child, replacing the mask when it comes off, but if the child goes to bed at eight and now it's midnight, you know, at that point to go, go to bed and try and get your own sleep. And, and you know, whatever, whatever we get, we get. Um, other strategies too include making sure that a child is not spending too much time in bed. A child who spends too much time in bed is going to be less likely to, to, to have a drive to sleep. And so they may be more alert and more able to struggle. Whereas if you shorten the night up somewhat, you may have better success um, at getting them to wear it. Okay, water condensation in the tubing is another issue which comes up frequently. And, there are f and the, reason, the reason this happens is because the heated humidified air passes through the tube, which is about six feet long, and oftentimes passes through an ambient air temperature, which is much lower, causing the water to condense within the tubing. There are a few strategies for dealing with this. One is to position the machine lower than the bed, lower than the head of the bed, so that there's a, a gradient in which the, the water needs to climb up in order to find its way into the face mask. Clearly that's the eventuality we want to avoid the most because water splashing into the face of a mask can really scare a child and, 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 and cause them to not be willing to wear the mask. Another thing which can be helpful is to uh, lower the humidifier setting. Another thing which is important to pay attention to is whether the water con condensation of the tubing and or splashing into the face happens immediately upon use or happens later on in the night. If it happens immediately, that might be a sign that the, the humidifier chamber is being filled too much and that water is simply splashing directly into the face. An uncomfortable interface. So, um, as I mentioned, the PAP can be delivered through a mask that sits over the face, uh, over the entire face, over the nose, um, can be done through nasal pillows. There are a lot of different types of interfaces. This is a picture of nasal pillows. Nasal pillows essentially look like oxygen prongs, nasal oxygen prongs, that are much thicker, about the thickness of my thumbs, which auto-inflate and basically sit in the nostrils and provide the positive air pressure through the nose. And one of the nice things about that is that people who have a tendency towards claustrophobia find these much less bothersome. Um, there are masks uh, such as this one, a nasal mask. Um, there, this is an example of a full face mask, which really covers the full face, not just the nose and the mouth. And it's important to think about the different kinds of masks there are and to try and choose one which will be suitable for the family and for the child. Um, this is another mask. This is what we typically call the full face mask, although as you saw, the previous example was a much fuller face. This is an example of a chin strap. And so, you know, thinking about the, the, the different masks, smaller typically is preferred by many people. Um, but as I mentioned, the disadvantage to using a nasal mask is when the mouth pops open and air starts to flow out the mouth, causing a drop in pressure, an increase in flow, dryness of the mouth, and general discomfort. And so one way of overcoming this is by using a chin strap. And this is just one example of a chin strap, which uh, one wears over the head and which draws the jaw shut. It does not clamp the jaw shut. You can open your mouth, you can speak, um, you can spit, you can cough, um, but it's a gentle reminder to the child to keep their mouth shut. And this is often all that is necessary. Other issues which arise are that of skin breakdown and irritation. Um, this I see most frequently in infants and toddlers who have the most sensitive skin. And the, the best, there are different solutions to this. One is to use a barrier such as uh, Mepilex or Duoderm, which essentially um, 
helps the uh, broken down skin to heal and prevents it from becoming further inflamed. Sometimes uh, a child needs to take a break from using the CPAP or BiPAP for a few days in order to let the skin heal. And sometimes it can be helpful to alternate between two different masks. For example, a mask that has pressure points here versus a mask that has pressure points here. And by alternating between the masks, one can uh, allow the, the area of skin which is injured to heal while maintaining the use of the positive airway pressure. Positive airway pressure and nasogastric tubes. As I mentioned earlier, one concern that many people have relates to overnight feeds and we to whether or not the use of positive airway pressure, especially in a child who is receiving overnight feeds, may heighten the risk of aspiration. And so um, this is an example of a child who is being given positive airway pressure through a nasal mask while receiving nasogastric feeds. And I really like this picture because of all the bad things that it shows. So if you look close at this picture, if you look a lot, follow along the NG tube, you can see the first thing it does as it passes underneath the board, the perimeter of the mask as it breaks the seal. It then goes into the nostril and blocks off 50% of the nasal airway. It snakes down through the oropharynx, which is open, and you can note that it's open because of the bubbling saliva that's coming out of the corner of the mouth, F stenting open the upper esophageal sphincter, stenting open the lower esophageal sphincter, and entering into the stomach. By keeping the esophagus open, it allows for easier transmission of airflow into the stomach, causing distension, and conversely, easier reflux up into the oropharynx when the stomach becomes too distended. So, I, the, the reason I like to show this picture is because I think it's really important to, to consider when you have a child who needs feeding assistance, for example, a child who has hypotonia, who has dysphagia, and who also has issues such as upper airway obstruction, obstructive sleep apnea, and hypoventilation during sleep and requires non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, it is very important to, to consider putting in a G-tube prior to initiation of positive airway pressure ventilation. This is an example of the feral bag and what it is essentially is it's a uh, feeding system um, which feeds into the uh, G-tube port um, but is attached to a Y connector which attaches out into the feral bag which is an open bag which allows for air to flow outwards. And so this allows for a child to receive nighttime feeds without having the stomach distended by extra air. Having a G-tube when using CPAP or BiPAP is actually really helpful because it allows you to vent. Certainly a child who has J-tube feeds but a G-tube port for medications can have the feeds continue through the J-tube without change and have the G portion open to allow for venting. Follow-up visits. Subsequent follow-up. How often you see the child back in clinic really depends on how well they're doing. However, if a child is still not set or there are issues or there may be other things going on or a child has a progressive condition um, in which I might think about the, you know, for example, a child who has a progressive neurological condition um, in which I might worry about deterioration, we ne then need to think about timing the visit sooner. Likewise, um, Younger children, especially because of the dynamic growth that occurs in the first years of life, may have their needs changed, as I'll discuss in a couple minutes, um, and so they may need to be reassessed more frequently. However, if a child is using the PAP well and not having any difficulties, I like to see them at least once every half year. And with regards to follow-up sleep studies, again, it really depends on what else is going on with the child. Um, but it is important to review them and discuss them with the families when, when you see them. Additional considerations. Other things which are important are to pay attention to positioning. As I mentioned earlier, sleeping with the head of the bed elevated to a 30 degree angle, for example, not only increases the functional residual capacity of the lungs, but also helps prevent some of the gravitational effects that can exacerbate obstructive sleep apnea. So it's important if you do elevate the head of the bed, which we often recommend in our children, that this be done in a manner which maintains the upper airway open. And so the corollary to this is a wedge or elevation of the mattress. Instead of using th two or three or four pillows which can put the child into flexion, it is better to use a wedge or to take a couple of blankets, roll them up and stick them underneath the mattress in order to elevate the head of the bed while maintaining a neutral plane of activity for uh, or flexion for the neck. Okay, nocturnal desaturation. So there are children who will over the course of the night start to desaturate 
down even while on CPAP or BiPAP. And this, of course, can be because the settings are not appropriate. It can also be secondary to gradual evolution of ventilation perfusion mismatching. As the functional residual capacity diminishes, the smaller airways start to close down. When a child is right on the cusp of clo keeping closed or opening up the smaller airways, you, one can develop a ventilation perfusion mismatching in which blood flows through those areas of lung which are not participating in gas exchange. Blue blood returns to the left heart and thus you have desaturation. Especially if you're, if you're caring for a child with low muscle tone, um, ways of dealing with this can be to reposition the child. Um, another way of dealing with this can be simply to use uh, a cough assist or to try and uh, employ other methods of recruitment in order to open up those smaller airways and avert the um, ventilation perfusion mismatching. Abrupt desaturation can be, be because of mucus plug, especially in a hypotonic child who's using BiPAP for non-invasive positive parenter ventilation. Um, a mucus plug can cause abrupt desaturation. If that were to happen, you might want to use an umbu bag or you might want to use a cough assist in order to try and address this. Um, I mentioned the drifting desaturation. This is an example of a cough assist. A cough assist is a device which generates um, a strong burst of positive pressure, generally 40 centimeter water, for a couple seconds. It's held for a couple seconds, and then a strong outward burst of negative pressure, usually minus 40 centimeter water, which draws out secretion. So the inspir inspiratory pressure recruits the lungs and mobilizes the secretion. The negative helps pull them out. And using this can not only help open up the airways in terms of secretions, but also help with um, recruitment. And therefore, the, although the cough assist is typically prescribed to be used in four cycles of four breaths, in, out, in, out, in, out, in, out, I usually recommend using it for three cycles of four breaths, followed by a fourth cycle of three and a half. In other words, the last cycle is in, out, in, out, in, out, in, <gasps> and then take the mask off in order to facilitate recruitment and to prevent the slow evolution of ventilation perfusion mismatching. As you can see on this slide, this is a slide looking at the effect of positioning on functional residual capacity done in Dr. Nunn's lab. Dr. Nunn was a physiologist in Britain. And what you can see is that lying in the prone position left people with a functional residual capacity of about two liters, but when they were at a 30 degree angle, they had functional residual capacities that were increased by 25% to two and a half liters. And that's a big difference. And so again, if you've got a child who has low baseline saturations at night and or has trending desaturation across the night, it may be because of the evolution of ventilation perfusion mismatch in the setting of low functional residual capacity. And so in small interventions such as elevating the head of the bed and or using airway clearance such as with a cough assist may go a long ways towards uh, preventing this from happening. Many people will comment on how difficult it must be to treat children with Down syndrome, for example, and other developmental disabilities um, with CPAP. There have been studies which demonstrate, for example, um, that children with Down syndrome who come to care because of upper airway obstruction are often treated with tracheostomy. There was one study done by Ron Mitchell which showed that out of 20 two children who came to a tertiary care ORL practice, six were treated with tracheostomy. And one might assume that this is because people looked at these children and said, well, they're four months old, they've got obstructive sleep apnea, and I know that so many children with Down develop obstructive sleep apnea, might as well trach them instead of struggling with CPAP for the rest of their lives. And I, I want to stress that this is not in fact the case, that many of these infants especially will outgrow their obstructive sleep apnea and therefore it's important to, to perhaps see if you can get through that period with CPAP rather than deciding to adopt a more aggressive approach. How much treatment is enough? And as I mentioned, the CMS criteria are four hours of CPAP use a night for more than 70% of 30 days in a 90-day period. In other words, one has to use CPAP for greater than four hours for 21 out of a 30-day period in the first three months that it's been prescribed. Now, those criteria have no scientific basis. Um, they do make one's life easier to, to if they are met, 
in terms of having to uh, having to uh, struggle to get the CPAP paid for and covered by the insurance companies. However, there, there really aren't data. My own personal feeling is that more is better, and yet I have patients whose parents tell me that if they if their child uses the CPAP for an hour and a half a night, they are a completely different child in terms of demeanor, in terms of behavior, in terms of activity level, and in terms of cognition. And so I, I don't I don't think we know yet how much is sufficient. That said, I think it is probably better to work on getting children to use it within the limitations that I've already discussed, such as, for example, driving the parent crazy and keeping the, the parents from sleeping at night. So it is important to encourage the, the, the parents and the child to use it, but also to frame the expectations in a realistic manner. Long-term follow-up. Um, as I mentioned, I like to see these kids back every six months to make sure things are going well. Typically speaking, the insurance companies like to have a re affirmation of the need for CPAP, um, oftentimes accompanied by uh, an attestation stating that the child is using and benefiting from the CPAP. I typically like to see these kids back every six months and certainly sooner if there are any issues or concerns. The final uh, few slides relate to the 3 a.m. phone call. And really, this is something which some people have concerns about, but, but in fact, it's actually pretty easy. So you can have mechanical issues which prompt a 3 a.m. phone call. The machine is broken, there are problems with the mask or the tubing, you know, the dog ate the mask, the cat scratched the tubing, there's a power outage, um, there's an air leak, the high pressure alarm and event is going off. Um, and you know, when these things happen, the, the real question that I think one needs to ask oneself is, what will happen to the child without using the PAP? If it's a child with a neuromuscular disease who really um, can't ventilate without using their PAP, that's a child who needs to come to the emergency room to get an alternative mode of ventilation set up before they can return home. Um, if it's a child who has obstructive sleep apnea, who had had it for six months or a year or two years before being diagnosed, um, and now there's a problem with the machine, it can probably wait a day or two or three until the company can come ahead and fix it. Um, other reasons for a phone call would certainly be patient deterioration. You can have acute respiratory decompensation, for example, if there's a mucus plug, and that's something which we've already talked about. The potential for pneumothorax, um, gastric distension or discomfort, certainly aerophagia, which causes abrupt gastric distension, can be very uncomfortable. Um, and new onset snoring, which we discussed. And thinking about new onset snoring, um, one needs to think about how that might be secondary to a change in the patient's overall condition because of gradual change. For example, the child or the adolescent has put on a lot of weight and now needs more pressure to open up their upper airway versus a child was recently started on baclofen in order to relax muscles and that in itself caused the upper airway muscles to relax. And so now it's a question of finding the right balance between the baclofen, which may be causing worsening of the obstructive sleep apnea versus this obstructive sleep apnea. Um, and people who'd like to do some further reading, there, there are certainly many resources um, available. Uh, thank you very much for your attention today and for listening to today's talk about the management of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation in the home. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.